They're under strong delusion. And this is shown all throughout the scripture. See, the strong delusion is the spirit of error that John talks about. It's the false prophets that Jesus named. It's the error of the wicked that what Peter used in 2 Peter 3. It's the thieves and the robbers that Jesus mentioned in John 10. It's the same root word. They're all talking about the same thing. The man that gives over, the mankind himself that gives himself over, God gives him up in his wickedness and puts him under strong delusion. Because why? Because why? Not because they were assigned to that, they were elected to that, that it was all God's doing. No, because they would not receive a love of the truth. They would not believe the truth. They would not receive a love of the truth. So God gives them over. Again, you get what you want. That's what you want. You want strong delusion. You want to believe that you're saved in your sins, that committing adultery is just a mistake and, and murdering somebody and, and all you got to do is whisper a little prayer and everybody's forgiven and hold your hand up and, and be passed a card and, and sign that card and you're in heaven. If you want to believe those things, then God, go ahead and believe them. If you want to believe all these pop singers and these, these so-called gospel music is, is of the Lord and it's beautiful, uh, it's bringing people to a uh, knowledge of the truth while our nation becomes more reprobate and decays further and further into the pit, well, then believe it. God's not going to stop you. He's not going to change your desires when you're not willing to rule over that sin. You're not willing to obey His first command. You're not willing to listen to sound doctrine. So that's what happens here. Mankind, Anthropos, not a certain man. Let's see, if, if he wanted to say that the man of sin or the mystery of iniquity was a certain man, he would have used that word. But no, he used Anthropos, mankind. So did Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation 13, they use the same thing when he talks, when he talks about the mark of man. That mark of man, again, is mankind. Where he talks about the number of man. It's mankind. I can't go I, I ain't got time to go into the whole thing. But if you look at Revelation thirteen, it ties all this together. What he taught in Romans one about the image, about being given up over to your vile passions, exchanging the truth of God. And then John sees it in metaphorical sense in his vision. He sees the he, he, he in Revelation, starting in verse eleven, he sees the beast representing man coming up out of the earth. Coming up out of the earth, this looks like a lamb, speaks the language of the dragon. It's exactly, he, he, the lambs and sheep, the, the lambs the, are wolves inside. Wolves in sheep's clothing, as Jesus called him in Matthew 7.15. He looks like a lamb, he speaks the language of the dragon. He performs great signs. I told you about those signs. The signs, he wants everybody to look for these signs. Israel building the temple and, and the new homeland and, and this is happening and all this prophecy is fulfilled and that prophecy, you go, you got to be ready now. This, the signs, the false signs and wonders. With those, he, he uh, deceives everybody on the earth. He deceives all who dwell on the earth. It's granted for him, he's, he's got power. The power of the dragon because he's speaking the language of the dragon. So what's he do? He brings that image. He gives life. He gives a breath to this image. He points to the image and he shows, this is Jesus that you follow. This is the Lord that requires nothing, that demands nothing, that just wants you to, to have a wonderful life and a fulfilled purpose in your life and have all the good things and all the, all the things fulfilled in your life. Have a good job and a car and a lot of money and, and all this other nonsense that they preach. The image, the image. He gives it breath. That's what it means here. It's all metaphorical. It causes it to causes it to walk, talk, like the real Jesus. So people bow to it. The whole the whole professed Christian world in the false system. And then it says that you know anybody that won't worship that image is killed. Again, another metaphor. They're killed, they're, they're denied, deprived of spiritual life. Then what's he do? He dispenses the mark, the evil eye of the flesh, which, which I already went through. The evil eye of the flesh that you refuse to pluck out and cast from you so that they'll all worship this false image. So, so it, says, it says, and he causes small and great, rich and poor, and slave and free, in verse 16, to receive a mark on their right hand and their forehead. They can't buy or sell. Receive a mark, another metaphor bestows on them as a gift, is what that means. He bestows on them as a gift, 
this false image of Jesus that's going to forgive them in their sins, allow them to live in their sins, wallow in their sins, go to heaven in their sins. That's what He bestows upon them by dispensing on them the mark. The mark being the evil eye of the flesh, not some tangible chip or, or electronic thing. Or, that's all nonsense. It's movies. Hollywood. It has nothing to do with the truth. You think that this is going to be clearly something tangible that everyone can see? No, not at all. Not at all. This was given to the holy apostle John in this metaphorical mystery sense. And you can dig it out by comparing Scripture with Scripture if, you, if the eyes of your understanding are open to the truth. So, you can't buy or sell, he says. Well, meaning, people like us, we can't go into the system and preach and teach. They won't let us in because we preach an, a contrary to message to their gospel, like I've shown you in many, many videos of mine. It's an entirely different message that they're preaching based on this lie that they've exchanged for. That's why they're given over to their vile passions. And the lust of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of... And many of them are reprobated. Many of them are seared. They're into pornography. They're into molestation. They're in, you name it. And it just seems like every day you shake your head and wonder, when's this all going to end? When's the Lord gonna gonna come back and judge judge this this horrible earth and end this mess? Hasten his return. So the number of mankind is clearly seen. Clearly seen here. The number of a man, not not a certain man, that's gonna rise up and take over the world. And it's ridiculous. There's armies and armies of false prophets preaching this lie from a darkened heart who have suppressed the truth. They've never repented of their sins. They never came through the process of coming. That's why they don't understand repentance. That's why time and again you can ask them any number of questions to these pastors and churches, and they have no clue what repentance is about. They don't know what a clearing of wrongdoing is. I've said that to people from the church systems. They don't even know what I'm talking about. I say, well, it says right in the Scripture in 2 Corinthians 7, clearing... Clear yourself of wrongdoing. Well, they don't even, they've never heard it. Just like they've never heard that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and unrighteousness. No, they're taught the grace of God is cutting them some slack so they can live in that darkened con condition they're in and they don't have to worry about it. See, accept Jesus and confess that you were a sinner and born that way and then just go about your business and God will give purpose and direction to your life and meaning and that's the way they sell the gospel to these people. Now, well, it's a little different with guys like Ray Comfort and stuff, I know. You talk, oh, you got to get them to admit they broke the law. And, but it's still the same package. The still bottom line is everything's been provided for you. You just have to trust in that provision, and then everything's fine. There's no love in the truth. There's no ruling over sin. There's certainly no stopping of any sin. You'll never hear those guys say that you have to stop sin. And even those street preachers out there that claim that they're preaching that are still not definitive in their explanations about stopping sin. They're still vague about when does it stop, where does it stop, how does it stop. You can't get no straight answers out of anybody because they're in this mess. As long as they want to keep one foot in the door to church, the system, then they're going to be compromised with this lie. You've got to come out, just like Revelation goes on to say in chapter 18, come out from her, that you share not in her plagues. That's the only hope for anybody to rule over this. Come out. Just like he said to Cain, we're all the way back to the beginning of the message, you should rule over it, Cain. I can't rule over it for you. If I could, I would. But I can't. You have to rule over it because I gave you free will to do so, to choose between right and wrong. And a mercy seat is open. Forgiveness is there. You can have the vileness of your sins washed away. The, the, horror, the horror inside you. The guilt and, the, and, the, and the, the degradation. It can be washed away in His blood. But only through repentance. Only through a real genuine clearing of wrongdoing. And that's going to take a season of godly sorrow and a crisis of conviction in your life. It's not something that can happen between 10.30 and noon at your little neighborhood church. I say get out of the churches, and I say refute their lies, because many people are perishing as a result of their lies.
So understand, understand, you can get given up and given over and become reprobate. And in that state, it would be very, very unlikely that you could ever come back to God. God help you.